Hi, welcome to the Parenting with a Disability Know Your Rights and Take Action webinar. Um, thank you all for joining us and today we have Rachel and Robin and so I'm going to get things started by turning it over to Rachel. Hi Rachel. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, this, my name is Rachel Patterson. I'm our Director of Public Policy here at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation and I'll be joined in just a little bit by Robin Powell. Uh, she is the co-founder of the Disabled Parenting Project and uh, the author of a really fantastic and comprehensive report from the National Council on Disability all about this issue uh, that we'll be talking about in a little bit. Uh, as you know, what we're talking about here today is parenting with a disability, helping people know their rights, know how disability law protects them, and also how to get involved in advocacy and take action to make sure that other people know their rights and that the civil rights of parents with disabilities are protected. Uh, but before we get into that, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, where we're from. This is a project of the Paralysis Resource Center, which is part of the foundation. Uh, and you probably know, but in case you don't, uh, we're meant to be a comprehensive resource on living well with paralysis, living a healthy and independent life. And in order to do that, we provide all sorts of ways to get in touch with us and to get information. We have an informational hotline. We have written resources that you can ask for and we will send to you for free. We also have a lending library of, of library books about all sorts of different things related to everything from living well with paralysis to media, de media depictions of people with disabilities. We have a peer and family support program that can connect you with someone in your local community uh, living with paralysis or if you're a family member, someone who is also a family member to help you navigate the world, answer questions, or just you know, learn from someone who's been there. Uh, we have an online community of bloggers and information sharers. Uh, and finally, we do advocacy and education. That's a lot of what I do down here in D.C. Uh, working with Congress and administration to make sure that they know about the lives of people living with paralysis uh, and what people need. Uh, and one of the reasons that we wanted to get involved in this issue of parents with disabilities is that it, it hits close to home for us. Uh, some may or may not remember, but so Chris and Dana were parents. Christopher Reeve had three children and wrote beautifully about his life both before and after his injury and how having a disability changed but did not diminish his role as a parent. Uh, it, it changed their lives together um, and in some cases made things better. The, there, there's two pictures on your screen right now. One is of the three Reeve children, uh, Matthew, Alexandra, and Will. Uh, the other is of Bill Cauley who runs our peer and family support program. They're there with his daughter. Uh, he's one of our employees and one of the uh, parents with paralysis who's in our community and could be impacted by uh, the laws and regulations and, and perceptions and stereotypes about people with disabilities and their ability to be parents. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Robin and she's going to tell you more about this issue. Thank you, Rachel. And I just want to note um, that Christopher Reed's daughter, I had the opportunity to speak, uh, see her speak last May, and I think she really articulated it well, just how actually his disability may in some ways have improved their family's well-being and you know, made her who she is now as an adult. So I think we always think about disability in a negative light, um, and I think it's really important to also think about how a, parent, a parent's disability can actually um, bring the family closer together and strengthen the bond. So um, I just wanted to note that and thank everyone here for joining us. Um, I want to first talk a little bit about who are parents with disabilities and their children because um, we need to know who they are in order to be talking about them. Um, and the short answer is really we don't actually know. There's very little data that is being collected on um, parents with disabilities. Unfortunately, this is not something that's in the purview of most surveys, um, disability service providers often don't collect information on whether their consumers are indeed parents. So um, right now, everything is based on estimates, um, and I'm hoping that that will change in the future because I think you know as we're developing policies and practices, it's important to know exactly the community that we're serving. 
So all of that to say that there are at least 4.1 million parents in the United States who have a disability. Um, and that is 6.2% of all American parents. Um, so we're talking about a very large number. Um, if you want to look at it from the child's perspective, estimates indicate that at least 6.6 .6 million children in the United States have a parent with a disability. So that's nearly 1 in 10 or almost 10% of U.S. children. Um, so as you can see, the number is large. I'd also point out that the number is growing. Um, as the people with disabilities, all disabilities become more integrated into their communities and are working and um, learning and really just becoming active members of the community, many of us today not only want but expect the right to have um, children. So I want to point out that this number is first grossly underestimated, I would guess, and second, it's a number that we will continue to see grow as opportunities arise. Um, and when I talk about disabilities, I really do mean it in its broadest sense. So I'm talking about people with physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, psychiatric disabilities, um, people with sensory disabilities. So it really should be um, thought of in the most broadest sense. It's talking about veterans who are returning home with service um, related disabilities and really anyone who has some sort of impairment. So as Rachel mentioned earlier, I had the opportunity and really privilege to work on a report which I'll mention in a moment called Rocking the Cradle, Ensuring the Rights of Parents with Disabilities. And through this comprehensive report, it really showed that parents with disabilities, first of all, face a ton of discrimination. Um, and you can see it mostly in four different systems. So I want to talk just briefly on what that looks like for each system. So first, the child welfare system. For those who are not necessarily familiar with what that means, every state has what they call a child welfare or a child protective um, agency. Um, a lot of agencies across the country are called like Department of Children and Families, Department of Children and Family Services, Department of Social Services. Um, every state's agency is slightly named differently, but it's all the same. It's all part of the child welfare system. And what we've learned um, through working on this report is that really child welfare is very ill-equipped to support parents with disabilities and their children. They don't have the necessary training on what their legal obligations are and how to work with parents with disabilities. And all of this results in um, pretty significant discrimination by the Child Welfare Agency. And what I mean by that is statistics show that parents with disabilities are more likely to lose custody of their children or even to be involved with the child welfare system if they have a disability, if you compare them to parents who are not disabled. Um, and then once they become involved, as I mentioned, child welfare really is not equipped to work with parents with disabilities. And it's something that we're working to improve, but parents with disabilities will often be denied reasonable accommodations, the appropriate support. So all of this really shows that um, child welfare practices as they stand are fairly discriminatory towards parents with a variety of disabilities. The second area that parents with disabilities face significant discrimination is within the child, or rather family law system. So what that means is really the courts where parents go to um, determine custody and visitation. This often will come up if there's a divorce or some sort. So unlike child welfare where it is the parent fighting the state for custody of their children, in this situation it is the parent fighting the other parent. Um, and those types of cases are really subjective because it is not a state. You do not have due process rights. You have much less rights. Um, so what happens is parents with disabilities will go into these courtrooms um, and these decisions are based on what they call the best interest of the child standard. And unfortunately, that has manifested in itself in meaning that um, disability is not in the best interest of the child. And so what happens is often parents with disabilities, if the other parent is not disabled, they will really encounter significant um, barriers to being um, granted the opportunity to either have custody or visitation of their child. Um, and this shows up in case after case. There are cases where um, the other parent, the non-disabled parent, really was not ideal for the child. Um, they were estranged, they were, have a history of abuse, and so forth. 
but the judge ultimately decided because that parent did not have a disability, they were in fact the better parent. Um, this showed up most recently, and it made news rather, a few years ago there was a case involving a woman named Kenny O'Neill. She was a paralyzed woman, a um, veteran, and she had just had her child, and 10 weeks later, the father of the child went to court and said that she was ill-equipped to take care of her child because she was paralyzed. Um, and the judge went with this for a while. This case continued for over a year before it was finally settled out of court. But things were really egregious during that time. Um, questions about whether she could throw a ball, for instance, were raised. Um, really ridiculous things when you think back at your childhood, you do not think about the parent who threw the ball to you. Um, and as Katie O'Neill established throughout the court case, was that she had prepared. She had gone and gotten the accommodations. She had gone and gotten the adaptive parenting equipment. But really, discrimination reared its ugly face in this case, and it really does often in family law cases. Another area that um, prospective parents with disabilities will face discrimination is within the adoption system. So when I say that, I mean both domestic, so if you're adopting within the United States as well as international. Um, and adoption also includes foster care. So if you are a parent or rather a prospective parent with a disability, you are likely or more likely to encounter um, questioning by the agencies. How will you do this? And often really explicit and implicit discrimination. So that some agencies will really not be smart and they will outright say, we are not going to allow you to adopt because you have a disability. More often than not, however, it is really, they will send you, give you the runaround. Um, I've talked to parents where it took 10 years to be able to adopt their child. Um, and because of all this, there's actually, it's been shown that parents with disabilities will often go and adopt internationally because they face less discrimination um, than in the United States. Um, and I think that's really something to think about. In the United States, we have hundreds of thousands of children every day that need to be adopted, and yet we are making these very blatant determinations that because someone has a disability, they are unfit to take care of the child. Um, and then the last area where parents and prospective parents with disabilities face significant discrimination is in the area of reproductive health care. Um, this will often manifest itself with women, although men can certainly have problems too. Um, if women with disabilities go in and they want prenatal care, um, they'll be often denied it. Their doctors will say, you know, I really don't think you should be um, reproducing. And they'll, you know, say, I don't know if it's good for your health, but they'll also say really ridiculous things about, can you really do it? Um, they really show their body deep in this area. Um, and this is especially true if a person needs any sort of fertility treatment for assisted reproductive technologies. Women often have to go provider to provider to, first of all, find a provider that will provide them the services, and also find a provider that will provide them acceptable reproductive health care. Um, I've spoken to many women who throughout their pregnancies were never once um, weighed, which was a real problem when it came to giving the epidural because they did not know how much the person weighed. Um, and that, I find that to be discrimination. If they are not living up to their civil rights obligations and providing accessible reproductive health care, then that is indeed discrimination. Um, and then I would also point out that a lot of women with disabilities will be very encouraged to um, terminate their pregnancies and or undergo hysterectomies uh, to avoid becoming pregnant. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience, this does happen all the time. Um, so this is an area that's really um, rife with barriers and discrimination. As uh, Rachel and I both mentioned, um, this issue has really received a lot of attention in the last couple of years, which we're going to really talk about in a few minutes. Um, but this all started with the Rocking the Cradle report, which is, came out of the National Council on Disability. It's a wonderful report, and I'm not just saying that because I was involved with it, but it's really the first most comprehensive report written on parents with disabilities. Um, it's very long, but it's also very easily accessible online. You can choose the chapters you want to look at, um, so you do not have to read all 350 some odd pages. Um, but I think it's really important because this has really set into motion so many things that are happening today as a result of 
um, this report, and it was really the first time the United States government actually focused on this issue. The National Council on Disability is a federal agency, um, and this was the first time any federal agency had really dedicated any time or resources to working on this issue. And this all came about because of advocates. Um, National Council on Disability, their work is all based on what they hear from the disability community. And this was an issue that kept coming up time and time again to the agency where parents were expressing how they were discriminated against um, and that they wanted NCD to do something about like that. So I encourage folks to look at this report. It's available on the NCD website. And as I've talked a lot about so far, um, parents with disabilities are very much discriminated against. And so I think it's really important to know what your rights are as a person with a disability and a parent or prospective parent with a disability. And this is far too big of a topic to talk about in the next few minutes, but this is just a very quick overview. Um, and obviously, if you find yourself in a situation like this, you should find legal counsel. Um, but the overarching fact is parents with disabilities cannot be discriminated against based on their disability. And I say cannot, and they should not, but they still are um, discriminated against based on their disability. And I think over time this is slowly changing. But again, I think it's really important that we know our rights. Um, so first, I want to mention that the Americans with Disabilities Act is relevant in a number of ways. Um, so the ADA, for those who don't know, is broken up in titles. And what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes is Title II and Title III of the ADA, which are really the most important titles in my opinion. Um, but Title II covers all local and state government agencies. And what that means for parents and prospective parents with disabilities is Title II covers child welfare agencies, including contracted agencies that work with state agencies. So if you are a child welfare um, nonprofit and you are contracted with the state, you also have obligations the same as the state. Um, it also covers courts. There's really good decisions out there that show that Title II of the ADA absolutely covers the courtroom. And it says that you cannot be discriminated against in the courtroom based on your disability. Judges cannot discriminate. The courts have to be fully accessible. You need to provide accommodation. And then it covers some hospitals. And I say some hospitals because I'm meaning hospitals that are state, local, or county hospitals. Um, so Title II of the ADA covers child welfare agencies, including contracted agencies, um, courts, and then some hospitals. And then Title III of the ADA is known to cover what they call places of public accommodation, so really private, the private industry. And within that, it's really important and interesting to know that private adoption agencies are actually listed as an example of a place of public accommodation. Um, so absolutely, the ADA covers private adoption agencies, and those agencies include agencies in the U.S. that are involved in international adoption. So if they have businesses in the U.S., they have to comply with Title III of the ADA. They also, Title III covers hospitals, and it covers attorneys. So attorneys are required to provide accommodations to their clients. So what does the ADA guarantee then? It guarantees that people with disabilities are provided an equal opportunity, and in this case, an equal opportunity to raise their children. Um, they also have the right to reasonable accommodation. So child welfare agencies, for instance, must provide accommodations. If they're requiring that the parent undergo training classes, they need to provide accommodations so that the training classes are accessible. This also is relevant for parenting evaluations, which are so critical to both child welfare and family law cases. Parents need to make sure that the person that is um, evaluating them, first of all, knows how to evaluate a parent with a disability and then provides any sort of reasonable accommodations that are needed. Um, and I would also note that reasonable accommodations aren't just physical, they're programmatic, they're also communication access. So if a blind or deaf person needs any sort of communication access or even a person with an intellectual disability, the agencies are required to provide accommodation. And the obligations are very similar under both Title II and Title III of the ADA. I also think it's really important to briefly mention the Rehabilitation Act. Um, that governs, and that was the first civil rights law for people with disabilities, that governs all programs that are federally funded which 
For example, it includes child welfare agencies. All child welfare agencies receive federal funding, so they are required to comply with the Rehabilitation Act. And the Rehabilitation Act has all of the same requirements as the ADA. And now I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Thanks, Robin. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that, that great overview of, of the problem and how disability law does protect people. Uh, at the foundation, when we were looking at this issue, one of the things that we wanted to do was help people understand uh, both of the problem exists and how the law can protect them. Uh, so in, to do that, we put together a toolkit, a Parenting with Disability Know Your Rights Toolkit. And the idea behind this was to take all the really, really great information that Robin knows that was in the National Council on Disability Report and put it in a much shorter version, the kind of thing someone could pull up on their phone or have with them when they are at an adoption agency, in their doctor's office, in their lawyer's office, uh, it, you know, getting ready to go to court and say, you know, okay, no, there's disability laws that are national and they protect me. Uh, so we give an overview of disability law, which is a lot like what Robin just did with the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act. And then we describe how it applies in a couple of different cases, just like Robin did, how it applies in child welfare, in reproductive health care, uh, in custody, and family law, and in adoption and foster care. Uh, each of those are big, major areas. We also do a, a deeper dive into Native American communities. There is another law called the Indian Child Welfare Act that has to do with how Native American children are treated uh, because of a really terrible history of children being removed from their communities entirely and, and chosen to, to basically be, be placed with white families. Uh, there's additional laws. So if you are a Native American parent with a disability law, you have both the ADA Rehab Act and Indian Child Welfare Act. And then we wanted to give people a way to start taking action. Say, okay, you know, now you've been empowered, you've learned about these laws. Here are some states that are doing the right thing, that are removing from their books outdated and stereotypical ideas of how disability affects parents. Um, I'll talk about a little later on how to find out the laws in your state, but a lot of states do still have laws in the books that list disability as a reason to terminate parental rights. Uh, some states are, are, and some advocates in states are doing a ton of work to try and overturn these, and some states have been successful, but there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and then just like Robin said, uh, this is only an overview of, of what your rights are to hopefully give you an idea of, of where to start. But we also want to help you find legal representation. So if you find yourself in a situation, there's some resources as to where to turn to find an attorney who might know uh, about disability law. So that's also included in the toolkit. Uh, and the toolkit, like it says right here, is available on our homepage. Uh, so ChristopherReed.org. Scroll down just a little bit, and you'll be able to download it. I'm going to turn it back over to Robin. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I really encourage folks to look at the toolkit. I think it really summarizes a very long report and really gives people the information they need at the moment. Um, so as I alluded to, um, since Rocking the Cradle was released in 2012, it's actually, there's been a lot of activity both on the national level and on the state level. So I want to just let folks know a little bit about what's happening and how people can get involved. Um, because I think this is a movement that really will need a lot of people. Um, so what's happened since Rocking the Cradle on the national level? First of all, since release of Rocking the Cradle, there has been three congressional briefings, so events on the Hill with Congress and their staff, where we've talked about parenting with a disability, as well as gone into more in-depth looks at adoption and child welfare and so forth. Um, the issue has also received a significant amount of attention in the media. So right after the Rocking the Cradle report was released, um, there was a wonderful um, Associated Press AP article that came out. Um, it was really great. I highly encourage people to look at it. And it really set into motion so much media attention. Um, the AP goes out across the country, and so many newspapers picked it up. 
There was also a radio tour we did where we got to talk in 17 different communities um, to the local radio station. And I have to say that even four years after the release of Rocking the Cradle, it's still getting a lot of media attention. And I think that's so important in order to change attitudes, we really need to be getting this issue out there. Um, I also want to note that the Adopt US Kids website, which is a part of Health and Human Services, federal government, they have a website um, for adoption and foster care, and they included a section on their website specifically about prospective parents who want to adopt. And that's a really great resource. It's very similar to LGBT people who want to adopt. It discusses um, the different rights that you have and provides resources. It also has a great example of a disabled mother who adopted um, through the foster care system. So I think it was really exciting to see this um, page developed. Um, more recently, in January of 2015, the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services jointly issued what they call a letter of findings. Um, in this situation, what happened was the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services received a complaint from a mother in Massachusetts who had been discriminated against by her local child welfare agency. Um, the mother had an intellectual disability and our Massachusetts Department of Children and Families, DCF, came in. They determined that the mother was incapable of raising her child because of her disability. This was very arbitrarily, this decision was made in the hospital. The child was two days old. Um, but this report set into motion um, a very long and drawn out process. And the mother did file a complaint with the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services. Both the agencies investigated the case and they issued this letter of findings in um, January that said that, yes, the Department of Children and Families did discriminate against this mother. Um, they violated the ADA and Rehabilitation Act. And it discussed the obligations that child welfare agencies have vis-a-vis um, the ADA and Rehabilitation Act. So this was really monumental for the whole disability community because it was the first time that either agency had really affirmatively said that the ADA and Rehabilitation Act does in fact apply in these cases. Um, and this has really, I think, been a, um, you know, a real mover and shaker for our laws and our rights. Um, I think that what we're going to see in the years to come is that parents with disabilities are going to start to be afforded their rights because of this letter of findings. So I think it's really significant that people know about it. Um, a few months later, in August of 2015, um, both agencies, the Department of um, Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services, issued what they call technical assistance for child welfare agencies and courts. This was a document that's also available online. And it was sent out to all the state child welfare agencies and courts. And it again goes over what these agencies and courts' legal obligations are pursuant to the ADA and Rehabilitation Act. And this was um, released in celebration of the 25th anniversary of the ADA. And it's a really wonderful um, document. I encourage people to look at it. It just really lays out what agencies must do to comply with the ADA. And it also gives examples of how you address certain scenarios. And it's very cross disability. It talks about all disabilities. Um, more recently, and something that gets a lot less attention, but is definitely important to know, is that in January of 2016, the Department of Health and Human Services entered a settlement agreement with the Depart um, Georgia Department of Family and Children's Services. This was a case where a prospective mother filed a complaint with Health and Human Services because she was being denied the opportunity to become a foster parent in Georgia. And Health and Human Services went in, they did an investigation, and they ended up settling with the state of Georgia. And this settlement agreement, which is also available online on the Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights website, talks about how foster care agencies and adoption agencies you know, cannot just make blatant statements that parents with disabilities cannot adopt or foster. They have to evaluate them in an accessible manner. They cannot just, again, have policies that outright say that a person with a disability cannot become an adoptive or foster parent. Um, so although this settlement agreement I gets a little less attention, is a little less known, I think it's really important for those of us who want to become adoptive or foster care parents. And then most recently, um, 
on the national level, we are really excited to um, be able to attend, both Rachel and I, um, and several others, a White House forum on the civil rights of parents with disabilities. And this was an event where the White House brought in advocates, they brought in parents, they brought in prospective parents, they brought in researchers, they really brought a group of people that were involved in this topic and discussed ways that we can move forward to ensure that people with disabilities have the right opportunity to raise children. Um, and if so, people on this um, webinar are interested in seeing any of this, it is actually up on the White House YouTube page. Um, it was a three-hour event. It was really wonderful, um, and I think it was great to see the White House recognize this issue um, as an issue. Also, though, on the state level, there's been a lot of activity since releasing Rocking the Cradle. So before releasing Rocking the Cradle, advocates in Idaho, Kansas, and Missouri had been successful in getting state laws passed that said that you could not discriminate against a parent based on their disability. This was mostly in child welfare systems, although Idaho's law also covers family law and adoption. So we're coming, there was these three great state laws in those three states um, that were passed. And since Rocking the Cradle, um, several other states have passed similar laws. Um, one of the great things about Rocking the Cradle is we developed model legislation, which is draft legislation that states are encouraged to adopt. Um, so it's really easy for advocates to go to their local senators and representatives and say, listen, we have this great piece of legislation. Here's model legislation language, um, and the state should adopt it. So we've seen several states do so, um, or attempt to do so in the last couple of years. Oregon, for instance, shortly after Rocking the Cradle was released, Adopt a, adopted a law um, that said that in foster, or family law situations, rather, you cannot discriminate based on a parent's disability. Again, this is only for custody and visitation, so it is somewhat limited. Tennessee also adopted a legislation that says that parents with disabilities cannot be discriminated against. It was pretty broad. Um, the state of Washington adopted this great piece of legislation. It was specific only to parents with intellectual disabilities, but it was a great first step. And it talks about how child welfare agencies need to contract and work with the state disability agencies to provide these appropriate services and that they cannot discriminate against parents with disabilities. West Virginia changed their child welfare law um, in an interesting way. All it did was really say that child welfare, their child welfare agency has to comply with the ADA. So that was something that they already had to do, but it was great that they added that specifically into their child welfare agency law. Um, and they also pulled out pieces where it said that you could discriminate against parents based on their disability. The state of Maryland most recently just passed a bill. Um, advocates said uh, initially wanted this to include both family law and child welfare. Um, unfortunately, at the last minute, they encountered a lot of um, tension and really resistance from the state child welfare agency. Ultimately, this bill removes the child welfare part and it only applies to family law. Um, the thought process was, let's start somewhere. And so advocates will go again and try to get it um, passed to apply to child welfare in the next legislative session. And then South Carolina and Massachusetts have laws very similar to the model legislation that was in the Rocking the Cradle report. And unfortunately, both states have not yet passed bills. Um, South Carolina, this was the first legislative session that they did up, um, introduce this bill, and it was unsuccessful. In Massachusetts, which is the state I reside in, we've um, introduced it twice, and it's been unsuccessful. Um, unfortunately, this is what happens with this legislation, a lot of legislation. Um, it does take a few years to get bills passed, but I encourage folks to still get involved because it will eventually pass. Um, so really, if you take anything from this webinar today, it's really that this is a call to action. People need to get involved, whether you are a parent with a disability, whether you work with people with disabilities, um, whether you're someone considering parenthood, it's not too early or too soon to get involved. You need to get involved now. Um, there are a lot of things that have worked for advocates, forming alliances, working with child welfare agencies, for instance, is the best way to get changes. Um, work with the media. There's been so many parents and advocates who have great gotten really good media attention on this issue. And I think the more we can get the issues out into the public, the better. 
Um, work on system change, so it's not just laws, but making sure that the supports are available, that personal care assistance can provide services to parents, um, that you know, child welfare agencies are um, providing appropriate assessments and so forth. So it's not just all lobbies, but there can be a lot of regulations and just training that should be happening to child welfare agencies. Um, the biggest thing is education. Um, unfortunately, there's a very limited amount of education on parenting with a disability. Um, child welfare agencies often don't know their legal obligations, so we need to get out there and educate folks. We also need to educate ourselves on what our rights are. Um, and then work with both Congress and state legislators to pass legislation um, because it will take a multi-pronged effort and that includes um, legislation. Um, so one other thing that I want to quickly mention before turning it back to Rachel was um, since releasing Ark in the Cradle, I had the opportunity to work with myself and two other women, Tara Ayers and Erin Andrews, to form the Disabled Parenting Project. It's a website which I encourage folks to look at. Um, we are an online community by and for parents and prospective parents with disabilities. We are very new. We've only been up since March 23rd. Um, so we are really new and young, um, but we, are hope we want to provide a directory of resources and providers. We have a marketplace where people can sell and buy and trade adaptive parenting equipment. We have a library which provides all kinds of information for people on parenting with a disability. And then what I think is the most important thing is our community resources. So we have a blog which is written by parents with disabilities. Um, it's a great blog. Um, and then we have message boards and we have a very strong social media presence. Um, and so here's our information. Our website is disabledparenting.com and then we're both on Facebook and Twitter. And then I want to mention very briefly that we actually have a Twitter chat we are hosting today at 4.30 Eastern Time, so in a little less than an hour. Um, because next Tuesday is the anniversary of the ADA, we want to um, celebrate the ADA, discuss how um, it's impacted parents with disabilities, and how more needs to be done. So what does the ADA mean for parents with disabilities? And I encourage folks to really please join us today. Anyone can join, parents, prospective parents, family members, professionals, you name it. Anyone who's interested in this topic is encouraged to join us. All you need to do is go on Twitter and follow the hashtag um, ABA Parenting, and there will be a really engaging conversation. So I hope folks will um, get involved. I'm going to turn this over now to Rachel. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, so at the end, I'm going to go over just a couple of more resources that might be of interest to people, uh, and then we will take questions. So uh, start thinking of your questions now. You can type them into the chat box, and we'll be able to see them. Uh, and then we'll also do an audio question section. So first uh, is the Association for Successful Parenting. And this organization is targeted much more at parents who have intellectual disabilities or learning difficulties, as they uh, call them on their site. Uh, they're also fairly new, um, but could be a really, really good resource uh, if you or someone you know uh, is a parent or prospective parent with intellectual disabilities. Uh, next is Through the Looking Glass. They are a nationally recognized organization, really leaders in the area of parents with disabilities. Uh, and they also receive federal funding from the same uh, parent agency as the uh, Paralysis Resource Center. Um, they've been a really, really great partner on this and have a ton of information. They also, uh, the Reed Foundation actually just funded them to work on creating adaptive baby care equipment. So we're really excited to see how that goes. Uh, that's just one of their many projects. Um, but that's one we're particularly excited about and we're really glad that we were able to fund. Uh, and then next is to look up the laws in your state. So if you're curious how things stand in your state, I took some screenshots here of this map, but it's available online at the URL at the bottom of your screen uh, from the University of Minnesota. And as you can see, it really varies. There's some states where disability is not considered at all when terminating a parental rights. Um, however, unfortunately, there's a lot of states where lots of different kinds of disabilities are, are included. Uh, from mental illness, emotional disability, intellectual disability, or physical disability, um, and any kind of combination of those. So um, 
like like Robin said, there's more to do than to change state law, but working on state laws is a really good place to start. And it's a really great place to organize, um, especially if you have grassroots advocates and, and, are, and are looking to get involved at the state level. So the last, that's our contact information. Uh, I told you, you know, just a reminder who we are. Um, Robin, I'm not seeing any questions yet, uh, but I wrote down a couple of things that I was maybe thinking about when um, that maybe you could help with uh, when you were presenting. Uh, you know, you mentioned the parenting evaluation and and making sure you you are evaluated for someone who knows really anything about disability, knows how to evaluate a parent with a disability. Do you know how people might be able to find those folks? That's a great question, um, and I wish I had a really wonderful and positive answer. Um, unfortunately, there are very few evaluators that are actually um, accustomed with evaluating parents with disabilities or some really leading experts in the field. But the biggest thing you need to know is if you have someone who is evaluating you, um, what you need to know is the American Psychological Association, so the APA, has actually issued guidelines on how you should be evaluating people with disabilities, and it includes parents with disabilities. So the big thing you want to know if you are involved in any of these cases is have your lawyer figure out, does this evaluator actually know these guidelines? Are they familiar with the guidelines? Because I think that's a really good way to gauge, you know, does this person actually know anything about adaptive parenting? Um, you know, adaptive parenting or parenting with a disability is really something unique. We do things in a different way. It doesn't mean we do things in a bad way, but it means we do things differently. And we cannot just have the cookie cutter evaluation. Um, and, you know, things like making sure that you're evaluated in your house. A lot of these evaluations are done in facilities or offices, which are not accessible. You do not have your adaptive parenting equipment there. You do not know the layout as well. Um, so making sure that you are being accommodated in the appropriate way. Um, don't be afraid to ask for accommodations. Evaluators must comply with the ADA. Um, and if you think that the evaluator is not qualified to evaluate you based on your disability, you, have, you should be asking for someone who is qualified. Great, great. Uh, I'm not seeing any other. Oh, so the um, chairperson has announced that if you dial one, or sorry, star one on your phone keypad, you can ask an audio question. Is, is that correct? Are we ready to do that? And I see someone that just asked a question. Um, and yes, those guidelines for um, evaluations were written by the American Psychological Association. And they are based on evaluating people with disabilities in general, but within it, it talks about parents with disabilities. So there are a set of guidelines that um, evaluators should be familiar with. And they are available on the APA website. They're also mentioned in um, the Rocking the Cradle Report. And I think that answers sort of the second question that I got. Um, what is the info on the guidelines? Again, that's available on both the APA website and if you go to the Rocking the Cradle report, you'll see that we cite them there. And the big thing is making sure that the evaluator is familiar with these guidelines. You know, a great thing that I know lawyers do on the stand when they're trying to question the uh, competency of an evaluator is to say, are you familiar with the guidelines? Can you describe the guidelines? And I believe there's about 20 guidelines or so. Um, so that is a really great way to gauge the credibility of um, the evaluator. Great. Right. So I have a thing. Oh, one other thing I want to mention. I know Rachel, you talked a lot about um, grassroots advocacy, and I think a great way for folks who want to get involved. And you know, I get calls all the time. You know, my state doesn't have a law. How can I get it going? And the great thing to do is to call your independent living center. Um, the SILs are really involved, interested in this issue, and I think they would be a great as a new for um, pursuing this. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And they've really been, a lot of them have been the leaders in their states at getting the laws passed that have been passed. Correct. I was also okay. going to ask, uh, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and, and someone asked me, she was a woman who was about to become a grandmother and was asking me if there was any uh, focus on grandparents with disabilities or, or the kind of equipment that would help her care for her granddaughter. 
Um, so I can imagine maybe the equipment would be the same, but I don't know if you know of anyone working or focusing on grandparents. So we talked a little bit, not as well as I would have liked necessarily, but there's just not a lot of information on grandparents as well. Um, and that should be considered when you're thinking about parents with disabilities. Um, there is a very large uh, population of grandparents who are caring for their grandchildren, and I think it's in 28 percent of those grandparents have a disability. Um, and I think this number will also grow as more grandparents gain responsibility of their child, um, children. I know that through the Looking Glass does do a lot of um, work around the whole um, family spectrum, so that does involve grandparents. But I, the grandparents would have the same legal rights as a parent, so long as they have a disability. Okay. And then of course, if they, if, of course, the other thing I should mention is if they are the grandparent is the parent of a person with a disability, I get calls um, from grandparents often they'll say, you know, I'm trying to work with my child and they're facing a lot of discrimination. What role can I play? Um, so grandparents also are involved in that way. Um, grandparents can be really good advocates for their grandchildren and their um, own children. Great. Do we have any questions from the phone line? There are no audio questions. Okay, great. Uh, well, so the last question, sorry, Robin, I, was, I thought of all these things while we were talking, so I'm, I'm hoping you can keep answering my questions. This one's you know, a little more open-ended, but it seems like a lot of the problems we're facing, you know, there, there's legal problems, but then there's just kind of a perception problem. Uh, lawyers, judges, adoption agencies, child welfare, just regular folks kind of assuming if you have a disability, well, you obviously couldn't be a parent. Uh, you know, what, how do we change that? Or do you know anyone who's, who's working on maybe just bringing more visibility to parents with disabilities? I guess other than your project. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think as I mentioned, and I'm an attorney, and I would like to say, you know, laws will change everything, but they won't. Um, and that goes against my whole profession. But the fact is, we're, we're not going to change things until we change attitudes, particularly because so much of the discrimination against parents with disabilities is really attitudinal. Um, and we need to educate um, those that are involved in this on parenting with a disability. Um, social workers, I was a former social worker. I can assure you that social workers receive little to no education on disability at all. So they certainly aren't receiving the appropriate training on um, parenting with a disability. Um, judges, they don't have trainings on this. Um, attorneys have trainings on this if they're lucky. I mean, I've gone to several states who have, and I've trained child welfare workers and attorneys, but by and large, those are a handful of states. Um, most attorneys, they don't know anything about this. Um, the judges, um, they know nothing also. And the, unfortunately, those that are representing parents, particularly in child welfare agencies, are um, public defenders. So they have very large caseloads, and they just are overworked, underpaid, and they just, you know, I hate to say that they cannot be bothered with learning about this stuff. Um, and I think that's where protection advocacy agencies can really get involved. I think what needs to happen is family law or child welfare law attorneys need to start working with disability law attorneys because disability law attorneys know the disability law really well. And child welfare or family law attorneys know that area of law really well. And so I think as if you can get um, some sort of partnership or collaboration, that would be great. And I guess I think the thing at the end of the day is training, 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 um, getting out there. Training done by parents with disabilities is what I think needs to happen. And then I really, I push for media because I think that if media is done correctly, it can really um, change mindsets and educate people. And you'd be surprised who is um, sympathetic to the rights of parents with disabilities. It may not necessarily be the people you would suspect. Um, so I think the way I learned that through multiple media appearances I've had, it's always people I wasn't expecting to hear from that were the most sympathetic. So um, media can really change minds. Interesting. And then and someone, oh, someone just pointed out that long-term support is sometimes needed, which is viewed as a reason to terminate parental rights. And that is so true. Um, for a lot of people with disabilities who are parents, they may need some long-term support. And how do we get that if there's no funding? And the thing that folks don't often know is if you are in a child welfare dispute with the state, 
And the state child welfare agency goes and says, you know, we just don't have money. It's probably true. The child welfare agencies are very underfunded. But these cases involve the whole state budget. And I'm certain that you can find money within a whole state budget to help a parent with a disability. Um, and so much of supporting parents with disabilities may be long term, and it may also be intermittent. So you may have, if you're a person with a physical disability or even any other disability, you may have to provide supports early on as the child is um, growing into an infant, then a toddler. But then you might not need supports for a couple of years, and then you may need supports um, as the child gets older, working with the child. So it's not necessarily that you need support for all 18 years. It might be intermittent. It might also be if you need to be hospitalized for any way and you need some sort of respite services. Um, so I think there's this perception that, oh my goodness, we're going to have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to support this family. It's just not economically feasible. When in fact, it's typically not that case. It's not that most people need 24 hours of care for 18 years. And it's also, been shown time and time again that it's so much more economical to support a parent and their child than it is to put the child into foster care. That's a great, great point. Uh, well, what I think with that, I think we don't have any more questions. Oh, there's oh, one more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is there anything percolating around um, parents with disabilities and navigating attitudes in school districts? And that is something we're going to actually discuss on the Twitter chat in a little while. Um, but the ADA does apply if you are a parent and you are going into the school to see your child. Um, you should certainly be able to raise um, the ADA if you need any sort of accommodations. And you know, attitudes is such an interesting question. Um, you know, children are so they're the best group to change attitudes with. I think if we can change the mindset of children, we're really going to be better off. Uh, um, I know a lot of parents with disabilities talk about how they go into their children's classroom and talk about their disability and read books about disability and really try to educate children. And I think um, I think that's something that's really a movement that is underfoot. And there are actually a lot of good books for kids out there on disability. We have some in our library on our website as well. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for all of that really, really great information. Uh, you all have our contact information here, uh, and I hope everyone can join the Twitter chat happening at 4.30 uh, with the Disabled Parenting Project. I'll put that information back up. All right, thank you so much, uh, and I hope to see you on a future ReFoundation webinar. Thank you very much.